Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we are going to be introducing the methods of real work and the methods, and the methods of virtual work as applied to the calculation of deformations and deflections uh, in uh, some simple uh, statically determinate trusses. We're going to be continuing where we left off in the last lecture, uh, looking at work and energy principles, and then we will then apply them to the anal to the analysis of the deformation of uh, deformation of trusses. We'll see uh, why uh, how the method of real work works, and also its limitations, and then we'll quickly introduce the method of virtual work and work through a quick example. All right, so today uh, we are continuing with our previous uh, look at. Oh, starting to look at uh, work and energy methods, and we are going to be start exploring the method of virtual work. Or more specifically, we're first going to explore the method of real work and see how that, con how that contrasts and why the method of virtual work is necessary. So again, uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, the method of real work and the method of virtual work as applied to calculating uh, trust deformations. So let's pick up where we left off uh, last time. Let's start by picking up where we left off uh, last time. So last time we talked about a whole bunch of material relating, or a whole bunch of uh, 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 subjects and material relating to uh, conservation of energy, potential energy, uh, internal, uh, potential energy, kinetic energy, work of a force moving through a distance, and most importantly, the uh, the idea of internal uh, strain energy or spring energy in the sort of classical physics context. And we had developed this equation, which comes from basic mechanics. So from last time, something that we developed, and again, this can be found in basic mechanics, is that delta L, the change in length in a member subject to pure axial load, is equal to FL divided by AE. Again, this is something just from basic mechanics, but uh, not uh, too bad. And that can be developed, uh, as you recall from last time, this can be developed simply from the definition of strain, uh, from the relationship between strain, stress, and modulus elasticity, and the definition of stress. So uh, what does this represent? As a reminder, this represents the peak force. This F here represents the peak force associated with a certain change in length or necessary to cause a change in length. And if we actually plot, if we were to plot F versus P or F versus X, X and then an F of X, well, our delta L would be down here on the horizontal axis like so, and then the height of this, well, I guess we would have, uh, we would have delta L uh, being equal to FL over AE, where F is simply the maximum force experienced by this bar. Okay, so not too surprising there. Again, just reiterating some material from last time. Now, um, what about, uh, so how can we actually use this knowledge to uh, calculate something like trust deformations? Well, the first thing I want to look at is the method of real work. We're going to see how you would apply the real uh, method of real work, uh, apply it to a simple uh, trust problem, and then see the limitations of the method of real work. So let's consider the method of real work. And this is not something you generally use often in design, even in creating computer programs and such. Uh, the method of virtual work is much more general and applicable, but uh, it is uh, still very useful for understanding why we call it the method of virtual work and why the method of virtual work is necessary. So the steps for the method of real work would be, uh, this is uh, really the, the method of real work is really the most straightforward application of work energy principles to trust deformation problems. So the steps would be fairly simple. You simply have your truss. You apply, the first step would be to simply apply the actual loads the truss experiences, or the actual loads the truss experiences, or apply your actual real loads to the truss. Uh, 
Um, and then you simply balance uh, internal uh, strain energy versus external work. Against external work. Uh, to find your uh, deformations. So uh, again, uh, going back to this, we know that if we have a force deformation diagram, we know from physics that the area under this curve is equal to the work done by this force. And the uh, area under this curve, the integral of the f of x dx, this is simply, again, I'm using u for uh, stored energy, internal energy. Uh, that's a triangular area, so 1 half base times height. 1 half delta L times f, or substituting uh, delta L in for this, uh, substituting fl over ae, I get 1 half fl over ae. Uh, times f, or f squared l divided by ae. And that is the internal strain energy stored in a single member of the truss. Um, however, if we apply a load, uh, as we know from our previous uh, studies of trusses, when we apply... Oh, thank you. Yes, I lost my divided by 2. Thank you about that. That divided by 2 disappeared somewhere along the way. Um, so, um, actually, wait, I was just seeing if you were paying attention. That's what that was. Um, anyway, so uh, let's say we have our, again, this is the strain energy stored in a single member. And we know from our study of trusses that a, uh, a single external load applied at one point on a truss can produce loads in all the members of a truss. So, and each one of them will have a different value of energy stored within them because they'll have different values of this coefficient f squared l over 2ae. So, uh, to actually calculate, to if we wish to equate the external work done by a uh, force versus the total internal strain energy, we have to apply we have to apply a summation. So, um, again, we want to balance the energy, and to do this, we're going to say. Um, Oh, any questions, or? Oh, okay. Um, for a point load P, if we have a point load P applied exterior to a truss, uh, the external work, W, is simply going to be uh, P delta over 2. Where delta is our deformation that this experiences, that 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 uh, that p causes at a location, and again it's p delta over two because p is a peak force, just like f is our peak forces here, or f is a peak force inside a member, and so to find the total to balance the total work and energy, we'll say that work is equal to our internal stored strain energy, or um, it, and again, we're looking for the energy not just in one member, but in all members. So we'll say that P delta over 2 is equal to the summation of F squared L over 2AE, and this is summed across all members. So if we have a point load P applied at a joint, and we wish to see what kind of deformation that point load will apply, um, the, the peak magnitude of that point load times whatever deformation it will cause divided by 2 is then equal to the summation in all members of the internal force that, uh, the internal forces that each, that, that point load P causes times each member's length, uh, divided by twice its area times E. And, uh, we will actually, uh, next look at an example. So, any questions before we move on to an example? Okay, I managed to not drop my pen, we'll be good. So uh, let's go ahead and 
clear the board, and I'm going to start working with an example. And we can see what these, uh, you can see a quick example of how these numbers are, how these formulae can be applied. And again, keep in mind what we're doing is balancing energy. We have a four external to the truss, we have a uh, external load, and it's going to cause a certain amount of deformation in the truss uh, at that point. And so that force then is going to end up moving through a certain distance. And that uh, work, that force times distance, must be equal to the total uh, strain energy stored inside all of the members of the truss. All right, so let's continue. And I'm gonna just work through a relatively simple example, just a, a simple uh, two-member truss, just for uh, an introductory example. And again, here we're working with the method of real work as contrasted, which we'll contrast later, with the method of virtual work, which, and the method of virtual work really is the more useful one. But uh, before we understand why it's called the method of virtual work, we need to see how to work with the method of real work. So uh, this is an example. So again, we have an example for the method of real work. And we'll say we're given the following. We are given the following. We have a simple two bar truss. And this truss has a horizontal member and a diagonal member. And in terms of dimensions, it's uh, this is going to be 12 feet high and 16 feet uh, wide, like this. And then um, we're going to apply a 36 kip point load uh, at the corner here, and that's going to be downward. So we have a single load, a 36 kip uh, downward load applied at uh, joint C and uh, using this joint label A, B, and C. And then um, if I want to label the slope on this, this would then have a slope of uh, 3, 4, 5, because the 12 and the 16 make a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So this is at a slope of 3, 4, 5. So again, we have a 36 kip downward force applied at joint C. And uh, I want to use the method of real work to find how, and, and what I'm looking for, actually I should say find, if I really want to be proper, I should say find, uh, find the vertical deflection at joint C. In other words, I want to see how far this trust is going to uh, bend downward under the influence of this uh, point load at C. So in other words, what I have is I have this truss and it is subject to this point load, P, and it's going to deform downward like this. And uh, my general formula has just a delta but uh, because I'm looking in the vertical direction, I am going to label this a delta y rather than just a simple delta. And that will be important later on. That distinction will be important later on. So we have delta y here. So again, delta y is the amount that joint C deflects downward in the vertical direction under the influence of point load P. So um, let's first get an expression for our P delta over 2. That is, again, the external work done by force P um, on this truss. So external work, the external work um, that is going to be, and again, P, the, th the thing to keep in mind with P is that this is a peak load. 
in reality, when you apply a load to a structure, you um, you can't apply the load instantaneously. You slowly in, you tend to slowly increase the load on a structure. And this 36 kips uh, represents the peak load applied right at the beginning. It takes as you apply load, the structure slowly deforms just like a spring would, and the amount of uh, force actually carried by the structure linearly increases as long as it's a uh, linearly elastic system. So the external work, U, is going to simply be uh, 1 half times 36 kips uh, times delta Y, or we could just call this 18 kips uh, times delta Y. So that's our external work. Now I do need now to find the internal work. I need to uh, I need to find all of the internal member forces. And I think you're all are pretty comfortable at that at this point, hopefully. And when I do, I find that FAB. Uh, F not FAB. Sorry, F. Um, Let's see, that is uh, FAC, the force in member AC, that is equal to 60 kips in tension, and FBC, this is equal to negative 48 kips, or 48 kips in compression. And then um, in order to do apply this formula, I also need to know the lengths of everything. And that isn't too bad. Uh, member BC here is simply going to be 16 feet, and member AC is going to be 20 feet. Just uh, you can find that by, of course, the Pythagorean theorem, or uh, simple, uh, uh, simple uh, special triangle relations. Okay, so I'm going to leave that formula down below, but erase everything above, so I have a little room to work here. So let's. Do that. Right. So we have our expression for our external work, and now we need to now we need to develop an expression for our internal strain energy um, caused by each of these forces. Because again, um, what's happening here is that I am stretching out member AC and I'm compressing member BC, and I'm stretching member AC just like we would stretch a string that requires energy. I'm compressing member BC and that requires energy just like compressing a spring would. So the external work caused by moving this force through a certain distance, if we assume that all energy is conserved, which seems a reasonable assumption, then um, that external work must be equal to this internal strain energy. And so the internal energy, again, is equal to this summation of F squared L over 2AE. So um, let's go ahead and get that. The internal strain energy is just going to be equal to U is equal to the summation of F squared L over AE, over 2AE, I should say. And the key, the summation is a summation across each member. So we're going to calculate this quotient for each member and then sub them together. So we'll have uh, 60 kips quantity squared times, uh, now this length, remember AC is, uh, 20 in, uh, is 20 feet or 240 inches. And then divided by, oh, also I should have uh, listed uh, a given, as a given, these have an, a cross-sectional area of five inches squared and they're made of steel. And I know from, uh, I know uh, a key steel property from mechanics and from steel design, that steel has an elastic modulus of 29,000 KSI. 
29,000 kids per square inch. So, um, and they all have, the, and, and in this particular problem, I'm keeping things relatively simple by having all, giving all of the members the same cross-sectional area. So then uh, 60 kips, so, so again, coming back to our summation here, 60 kips times its length of 240 inches uh, divided by two times five inches squared uh, times 29,000 KSI. And again, this represents the strain energy in member AC. Then I'll also want to do the same for my member BC. And this is going to be the force of uh, this force here in member BC is 48 kips. And I can put a negative on here, although the negative is going to cancel out because it's going to be squared. The length is 16 feet or 192 inches. And divided by, uh, again, just 2 AE, so 2 times 5 inches squared, times its elastic modulus of 29,000 KSI. And again, this represents the, the summation term uh, for member BC. And then if I go ahead and work through that math and sum these all together, uh, I will get, well, for member AC, I get 2.98. And if you work through the units, let's see, the KSI and the kips, and the uh, one of the kips cancel out, the inches squared and the per inch squared cancel out. And you're left with units that actually shouldn't be too surprising. Kip inches. Kip inches, that is a, that is a force times a distance. In other words, the, this is a, an amount of energy. Um, plus the same for member BC, and that comes to 1.53 kip inches. Again, a unit of energy. And then when you add those two terms together, you get a value of 4.50 um, kip inches. So what does this represent? This again is my U, my capital U. And this represents, uh, I can because I can calculate the internal forces from each member or in each member from this 36 kip force, I know I'm basically directly calculating how much energy is, is stored in each member because of this 36 kip downward force. And that amount of energy is equal to 4.5 kip inches. And if we wanted to, we could even convert that to a more conventional unit of energy, such as joules or something. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do that right now. Um, I'm curious what that, what that equals in like joules. It's actually probably a fairly large amount. Um, let's see. Let's do 4,500. Uh, let's do units. Uh, I'm just doing a quick calculator. Um, pound force. So 4,500 pound force times inches, and let's convert that to good old joules. There. Okay, if you're interested, that's about 508 joules. So not a ton of energy, but we do have relatively uh, small loads for this structure here. And again, the, and the amount of uh, because uh, structures undergo such small deformations relative to their lengths, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that the uh, amount of energy actually stored in them is relatively small. I mean, this is a, uh, if, if you have like a, you know, a 10 watt LED uh, bulb, it'll, it will burn through more and that much energy in less than a minute. So anyway, just an interesting uh, comparison. This, the, and to show, I just wanted to show that these are actual units of energy we're talking about. So, but our goal here was not to calculate the energy. Our goal was to find the deformation, the vertical deflection at joint C. And to do that, we're simply going to set internal strain energy equal to our uh, external work. Actually, I probably should have labeled this W rather than U to be consistent with my prior, uh, to be consistent with my prior uh, labeling. But W needs to be equal to U. So 18 kips times uh, delta Y times delta Y 
the external work applied to the structure must be equal to all of the internal strain energy stored within it. And that is going to be, be then equal to our uh, 4.50 kip inches. Uh, kip inches. Or if, and if I then divide this out, I get that delta Y is equal to about 0 0.25 inches or one quarter of an inch if you prefer. So again, we apply a 36 kip point load uh, to joint C and our uh, truss undergoes a 36 kip uh, downward or undergoes a 0.25 or quarter inch downward deflection at joint C. So, and again, this is the method of real work where we look at the actual forces inside the, tr inside the truss um, created by the actual external forces on the truss and directly balance, uh, use direct energy balance to calculate the amount of deformation that the truss undergoes. We assume that all of the, that as the uh, force moves through a certain deflection, all of that energy ends up stored within the uh, members of the truss. So, uh, any questions on this? Okay, so hopefully that's not too bad. Um, so I want to clear this off, and then we're going to start, I want to start looking at the method of virtual work. And uh, to before we illustrate the method of virtual work, we need to uh, illustrate that there's actually a problem with this uh, method of uh, real work that I have applied. Well, maybe not a problem. This calculation is still valid. It's just limited in what it can accomplish. This result here is, is perfectly valid. It's just not, uh, it's not as scalable as we really need in order to, uh, in order to uh, uh, produce all of the deflections that we're really interested in or calculate all the deflections we're really interested in. So uh, in order to, to illustrate what's wrong with this, or what the limitations of the method of real work are, we need to go and look at our, um, look at some of our uh, work and displacement vector relationships we talked about previously. And again, that's coming from sort of basic physics. All right, so like I said, we have one slight problem. And this problem isn't, doesn't mean that this calculation is wrong. It just means that it's somewhat limited. Okay, so problem. Uh, let's go back to what we assumed in this problem. Uh, so we assumed, or I assumed, that the truss would deform like this. So we had our simple two bar truss and we applied a load to it, and I assumed that it would deform downward. So I assumed that joint C went downward like this, and then we ended up with a deflected shape like this. And we had a corresponding uh, delta Y. Uh, actually, we used a lowercase delta, I should be consistent with that. We use a delta y like this. Now that's fine, but it's really incomplete, and that incompleteness is really from the fact that uh, when we have uh, trusses like this, they won't actually want to just they, they won't uh, tend to uh, tend to deflect only downward, like I assumed. They'll also tend to uh, they will also tend to deflect uh, sideways or laterally. So the real deformation would be more like this. The real deformation would, would be more like this, where we have, again, our original truss, like this. And this, again, this is, uh, of course, greatly exaggerated. But in reality, yes, the end here, point C will go downward but it will also tend to rotate to the left. 
this member here wants to uh, doesn't want to just stretch out. It also wants to rotate. And so it's going to go uh, more like this, joint C here. So you'll have, yes, you'll have this delta Y, but you'll also have some delta X. And this produces a problem for, for the uh, method of um, real work. And I need to clear this to illustrate what that problem is. So let's see what that problem is. Maybe you're already seeing it, hopefully, but if not, that's fine. So let's take a look at this and see uh, what is wrong with this. So you might think, well, can't we just balance energy there? Can't we just do the same thing we did before? And unfortunately, we can't, at least not, with, uh, not while using the method of real work. And the problem really comes down to real to our definition of uh, external work. So let's consider this. So again, can we just find, can we use this method of real work? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is that uh, think about the directions that our load and uh, that our load p here and our horizontal deflection are. Uh, so we have a the, the external load applied to our truss here is 36 kips acting downward. And for the, uh, for the delta Y, that's just fine. Uh, 36 kips and delta Y, the, or the point load P and the delta Y are all lined up. In other words, all of the, uh, the, force, the, the forces vector, uh, the force vector and the deflection vector are aligned. So all of the work done by this force is along this vector. Um, however, but look at the delta x. Delta x is going to be pointed horizontally, uh, horizontally and likely to the left. So how does that work? Well, if you if you go and dot our force vector into our uh, delta x, if you were to go and dot say p, the p vector dotted into delta x, you would get zero. You would find that there is zero external work done by force P moving through delta X. Because again, um, a force only does work when it moves, uh, it, when it moves in a direction parallel to its, um, parallel to its actual, or with some component parallel to its um, actual force line of action. So we have a problem. So again, the 36, the 36 kip force, uh, 36 kip applied force does no work as point C moves through this delta X because their vectors have n are no have no components that are aligned. So this is a problem. This is the limitation of the method of real work. Uh, the method of real work can only uh, find deflections. Uh, at the uh, location and direction where a load is applied. So if I had a very complicated truss, a mini member truss, and let's say I had a truss like this, not even a super complicated one, I suppose, just something like this. And if I had a load here, well, if all I wanted was the vertical deflection at this joint, that would be fine. I could calculate that using the method of real work. But if I want to know the horizontal deflection at that location, or I want to know, say, like the vertical deflection at mid-span, then I would be out of luck. I would have no way of doing that using the method of real work. So while the method of real work is perfectly valid mathematically, it suffers from some very, uh, very strong limitations on where it can be applied. So as you might have guessed, uh, how we're gonna go beyond that 
is to use, in contrast to the method of real work, we are going to use the method of virtual work. And this is one of our uh, most powerful tools as uh, in structural analysis when seeking to analyze the deflections of either statically determinate or statically indeterminate structures. Well, at least for trusses, it's primarily useful for statically uh, determinate structures, but um, you can actually use it if you combine it with uh, if you combine it with compatibility uh, to uh, help solve statically indeterminate systems. But I just want to look at basic statically determinate systems today, statically determinate trusses today. Keeping it relatively simple because this is complex enough. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so. Let's just clear the board and we will introduce the method of virtual work. And I think we'll have to, we might have time to work through a simple example, but uh, I hope to, I do have a simple example I wanna work through either this time or next lecture, but also I do wanna post some uh, longer form examples of this when we have time in class for a very quick, uh, uh, simple example. But I hope to also illustrate this with something a little more long form. All right, so let's introduce the method of virtual work. So the method of virtual work. See, what I really want to do right now is channel my uh, inner Lawrence Fishburne and get, get a nice like leather jacket and some big uh, dark sunglasses and say something to the effect of, what do you mean by real? How do you define real? But anyway, we're not using a matrix in this problem, so don't worry. Okay, so I'm going to define a real system and a virtual system. A real system and a virtual system. Uh, actually, I'll probably do this over here. So we're going to have a real system and a virtual system. And in the leet text, uh, this the variable for this, uh, for external loads, is P. And we also have uh, subscripts P. And for the virtual system um, in leet, these are designated by the variable Q for a virtual system. OK, so uh, the real system represents the actual loads and internal forces, um, or the actual loads internal forces and real deformations uh, and real deformations in a truss. Well, we could apply this to a frame as well, but we're talking trusses today. So you have your actual loads that you're applying to your truss, and you're, you'll calculate your real forces, the actual forces produced by those, and then um, some sort of, uh, and then we'll have some sort of actual deformations that we wish to calculate. Then we have our virtual system, which consists of, to, and to create our virtual system, we will apply a unit load which means a one kip load or one kilonewton load uh, of whatever unit system you're using, um, apply a unit load um, in the direction and location where you want the, uh, the, where you're interested in finding the deformation, in the direction and location uh, where deflection is desired or deflection is sought. So 
So in other words, if I have a truss, regardless of what loads are actually on it, if I want to know the horizontal deflection at mid-span, I will apply a unit load Q at mid-span, and Q would be equal to, say, like one kip. So if, again, if I want to, if in, a, in my virtual system, if uh, for whatever reason in this truss, I was interested in the horizontal deflection at this mid-span, I would apply a unit load to that truss at mid-span. And so it's the same truss in both cases. It's the same members, the same geometry, the same material, uh, the same everything. The only difference between the real system and the virtual system is that the real system has the actual loads that the truss must carry, and the virtual system has a, uh, a unit load applied in the direction that we're interested in and at the location where we want to calculate the uh, deformation. So um, then we can apply this equation here, the overall virtual work equation, which is as follows. So the book goes through the derivation of this, and uh, it takes a while to go through the derivation, but essentially what we're doing is uh, we're combining components of the work of the real system and the virtual system, and mathematically you can prove that these two equal to each other, uh, must be equal to each other. So the formula is summation of Q uh, delta P is equal to the summation of FQ uh, times FP over uh, times L over AE. So what do these represent? Well, this here um, represents the work done by virtual loads. Uh, in other words, this unit, this one kip virtual load. Uh, virtual loads moving through the real deformation at that location. Uh, virtual load moving through a real deformation. And delta P is what we're actually after. That's the actual deformation of the truss at that point. Um, moving through a real deformation. And this, uh, let's see, the, the, the FQ, uh, this is just the member force from uh, Q. Again, Q refers to our virtual system. So this is the member force in a given member from the virtual load, from the unit virtual load. And FPL over AE, this represents the uh, change in length uh, caused by the real member forces. So I know this may seem a bit confusing. Uh, there's a lot going on here, a lot of moving pieces. Deriving this formula is a bit complex, uh, but I would refer you to the text if you're interested in the full def in the full uh, derivation. But the steps are as follows. Um, first, we apply the real loads to the truss. Uh, apply real loads. Uh, find internal member forces. Find all of your internal forces. And then two, uh, we will apply a unit load at the location and direction, and at the location and in the direction of uh, whatever deflection we're looking for. Apply a unit load, and we are again referred to this as virtual, at the joint, Uh, at the joint and in direction uh, where our deflection is desired, or just delta is desired. And then three, we will apply this formula.
And to illustrate this, I, I want to go back to our previous truss. And this is going to be a relatively quick example because we already have all of our uh, internal member forces, thankfully. So I'm going to go back to our previous uh, example then. So let me clear this board here. And then we'll go back to our previous example. And see what both the virtual and real systems look like um, for a simple truss for a simple two bar truss. So uh, with the previous truss, because I already calculated the vertical deflection, I don't want to do that here. Instead, I want to calculate the horizontal deflection, which again is something we saw was not possible when working with the method of real work, but it is possible using the method of virtual work. So um, let's go ahead and do that. So we have the same truss as before, but this time we're interested in the horizontal deflection. So uh, let me go ahead and draw this out again. Uh, we have our truss. And in terms of length, again, this is 192 inches. This is 240 inches. And we have the real uh, 36 kip load here. So our real system, Uh, consists of all the real uh, external member forces and the internal forces. So thankfully we already have those. And those are a 36 kip downward force. And uh, this is because this is the real load on the structure, we're gonna this is what is referred to as P. Uh, then we have our, uh, we, just by simple equilibrium, we can find that the force, we found that the force in this member, the diagonal, is 60 kips tension. And then the force in the horizontal is negative 48 kips uh, compression. And in terms of deflections, uh, I would label this deflection uh, that I'm, uh, what I'm looking for is the horizontal deflection. And I I'm going to refer to that as uh, delta P, that again, P because it's the real system, and I might just put a subscript X uh, to designate that I'm looking for the uh, deflection in the X axis, the X direction. So this is our real system, and then we have a virtual system. And again, because I'm interested in the uh, horizontal deflection at joint C, I am going to apply a I'm going to take the exact same truss with the exact same properties and apply a unit horizontal load at the joint where I'm interested in the deflection. So I apply a one kip load here, and this is going to be Q. And then uh, the internal member forces, well, if I go and solve equilibrium for all of these, I end up with actually this top bar carrying no force and this carrying um, one kip in tension. So we have our real system, which again is our actual, which is our real structure with the real loads on it. And then we have our virtual system. And because I'm interested in the horizontal deflection at joint C, I apply a unit horizontal load at uh, joint C with all the actual real loads removed. Okay, so now all I will have to do is work through this equation. I'm going to go ahead and leave this equation here, but just give myself some room to work here. And this calculation won't take too long since we're, we have such a relatively simple truss. And so let's go ahead and do that. So again, this is our formula. Our summation of Q uh, delta P is equal to the summation of FQ PL over AE. So uh, let's just go ahead and set that up directly. So our Q, again, that's our virtual load. And that is going to be one kip uh, positive. And then our, uh, our real deformation, which is our delta PX, that's what we're after. 
And this then must be equal to the summation of all of these terms and summed across each member. So uh, that will be, uh, I'm just going to write uh, this starting on this line. And OK, so our FQ, again, that in, in each member, FQ is the force that the unit load causes in that member. So zero kips times, and then FP is the real load in that structure. And that's 60 kips. Uh, no surprise there. And then its length, 192 inches. And divided by AE, we said the area on each of these was 5 inches squared. And we have 29,000 KSI. Uh, for our uh, modulus of elasticity. Then, uh, we need to do the same thing for our horizontal number. And I almost always generally assume my, uh, my horizontal, uh, I always assume my unit loads are either to the right or upward. That does help with the math. But we do need to take care to apply our uh, internal member force here as negative, because it is compression. So our FQ for this member, our horizontal member, is one kip. That is the uh, tensile load in that member, in member uh I believe that was BC. So one kip. And then, um, let's see, our FP is our negative 48 kips. The L uh, is 192 inches for that member. And then it's divided by AE, which is again 5 inches squared times 29,000 KSI. And if you plug and chug through all that math, you will get that uh, delta Px is equal to negative 0.064 inches. Or uh, it was equal to 0.064 inches to the left. So work through all that math. This term, of course, is 0. And that term comes to negative 0.064. So even though we assumed that it was going to the right, um, because of our negative term in the that because that member is in compression, a negative value of force, uh, it ends up being actually to the left, which is what we would expect for uh, this kind of frame undergoing a uh, certain deflected shape. All right, and that is a brief introduction, <laughs> a brief and very rapid introduction to the method of virtual work. Any questions? Okay, so I know that was a lot in a short amount of time. Um, hopefully you're able to follow along to that. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And uh, if not, that'll do it for today. And thank you. Uh-huh. Oh, you're fine. Oh, shoot. You're right. That should be 240. That's a little error there. Sorry about that. Exactly. Yes, that should be 240. Sorry about that. Uh-huh. How did this equation come about, or? Uh, FQ, again, the summation refers to summation across each of the members in the truss. FQ is the, uh, the force in each member produced by the virtual force, the unit force. So we applied a one kip force here, and we uh, found that we had these two forces resulting. So it's so our so again every the Q everything that has a Q on it corresponds to the virtual system and everything that has a P on it corresponds to the real system. Ah, okay. 
So in the problem statement, we, we just knew that we wanted to find, that we, okay, maybe I should just say uh, find, and in terms of joints, this is A, B, and C. So we would been at, we'd have, would have been asked to find the uh, horizontal uh, deflection at C. So we were interested in the horizontal deflection at C, and that is why we applied that unit load at uh, joint C in the horizontal direction. Uh, wherever, basically, wherever you're interested in finding the deflection, you apply a, uh, a unit load at, in that direction, at that location. Uh, yes, you could actually use any load you wanted to. That would be perfect. That would be perfectly fine. But yes, one kip is a unit load is the easiest to work with. So, yeah, a unit load is just one of something. Uh huh. Exactly. Well, exactly. So think about this. If you had a, you have two perfectly horizontal forces, and let's say you had F uh, B C and F A C. Well, do the summation of forces in the vertical direction. You have F A C times some sine, th sine of theta, right? And nothing else. Exactly, it's very much like a zero force member, exactly. All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, so in summation, what we did today is we looked at uh, building up the method of real work, seeing how we can apply uh, or balance, uh, if we can apply energy conditions and uh, balance the external work caused by a force uh, versus, versus the internal strain energy that it, that, that produces inside uh, the various members of a truss. Uh, we worked through a simple example of the method of real work, and then we also saw the how limited that method can really be. Uh, finally, we introduced the method of virtual work, which applies a unit load at a location where a deformation is desired, and then we worked through a simple example. Uh, later, I'll have a another video posted here that covers uh, some uh, long-form examples of applying the method of virtual work to trust analysis. But uh, for now, hope you found this a little bit enjoyable or at least a bit informative. Uh, again, like, comment, and subscribe to make the YouTube robots happy. And uh, hopefully you found this a bit uh, uh, informative or you at least learned a thing or two about real work and virtual work and how to apply energy principles to the analysis of trusses. Regardless, I hope you all found this useful. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the next lecture. And as always, thank you.